am truly honored to be moderating a conversation tonight with the remarkable David Strathairn, whose name I have mispronounced for decades now, co-director and co-writer Derek Goldman, and Holocaust survivor Tofa Friedman. Please give them all a round of applause. And before we begin our conversation, uh, I want to take a moment to applaud directors Derek Goldman and Jeff Hutchins and writer Clark Young, producer Eva Anisko, Anis Anis Anisko, yes, and co-producer Alexander Hyde, as none of us would be here today without their incredible hard work. So give them a round of applause, too. <laughs> So Derek, I thought I'd start with you. I know that this play first premiered in 2014 at Georgetown celebrating Jan Karski's 100th birthday. Um, it has been quite a journey for this piece since then. Can you tell us briefly about the evolution of the play and the twists and turns it's taken through the years? Sure, I'd be thrilled to. Thanks, Katie. It's an honor to share the stage with you, Tova, and to be um, here at Museum of Jewish Heritage. We, um, we began in 2014. I would say just David has been there since the beginning. He's the only person who's played Karski in this play. Um, I teach at Georgetown, where the Lab for Global Performance and Politics is based, and uh, Karski is a, is a really important and significant figure on campus there, and we were asked to put together at the time what we thought was really just a reading on that special occasion. And it, initially it was David and students. It was an ensemble of students. Um, and it was a single performance, but at that performance we met hundreds of former Karski students and had a, a, a very powerful um, initial experience. We then continued with the ensemble version. We actually spent a few weeks here on this stage at Museum of Jewish Heritage in residency developing that version of the play with David um, and, and students. And eventually we um, uh, went to Poland and uh, as things evolved, we, we really realized that um, this is a, a this, we really wanted the story to be a direct exchange between Karski and kind of a an audience of his students and of witnesses. And so uh, at, in 2019, we premiered the version in which basically you're seeing now, which is David embodying all of those roles. Um, and as soon as we premiered it, COVID happened and live theater stopped. Um, but we had performed in London as part of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, and that's where we met Eva Anisko, um, and she, we had a conversation afterwards, and she asked if we had ever thought about doing anything with film, um, and quite extraordinarily, when, the, when nothing, nobody was doing anything during COVID, we were able to pull together this incredible team. She introduced me to the brilliant Jeff Hutchins, who, um, who's the direct, director of photography as well as co-director, and the, the, the visual world that you see in the film was really um, uh, what he created. Um, and the film wouldn't exist in this form, ironically, if it weren't for COVID in a way, because probably we might have done a film capture, et cetera. Um, and now we have the play and the film. These two, the play continues. We're going to Poland on Sunday to four cities in Poland, which will be a, a profound experience in this moment with the, with the theatrical production. We're, we're daunted and humbled by that. Um, we had a nice run in New York. We've been in Chicago and DC. Um, and we see these as really complementary experiences, the experience that we just had uh, watching it on film. I think what, what Jeff has done is really created something that's not just a proxy experience of sitting live in the theater, but really film, cinema, in a really, in a really beautiful way. So that's, a, I think, a rare thing as a theater person to have, you know, to have a film. In that. I'm going to ask you in a minute about the challenges of you know, moving from the stage to a film. But, but David, I wanted to talk to you about your incredible portrayal. This must have been uh, enormously difficult. I mean, just to have that much dialogue on, on for one person, a one man act play or whatever. And to, can you tell us a little bit of how you prepared for the role and how you came to really become Jan Karski? Um, thank you, Katie, and thank you for being here. It's really 
Um, an honor to have you here. It's great. Um, I wouldn't say that I really have become young Karski because uh, that's quite a, uh, that's a transformation I don't think anybody could make. Um, but uh, the, um, I've been very lucky that to have had almost, well, seven years now um, living with his story. Um, so it's been an incremental step of, of, of habitation, I guess you could say. Um, I've had incredible help and guidance from Derek and um, uh, Clark Young, who, is, uh, who actually was a co-author and uh, is all things Karski. Um, there's the, uh, uh, you know, the, the gift of having all his writings and all his speeches and his testimony in Shoah. And, uh, and what's really special is having met his students and um, colleagues of him who were very generous in, in sharing anecdotes about him. So uh, I, I was able to build a whole sort of library of, of information about who he was. He's still a mystery to me. Um, but it's, uh, it, with somebody like this, I think it could take a, a, a lifetime learning about somebody else, as complex a man as he is, and his legacy is so, um, how shall I say, pristine. It's, uh, it's framed um, in a stark way, but uh, it's, been, it's been a real, real journey. Um, continues to be a journey, and it's, um, it's, I just feel incredibly, incredibly privileged to tell his story. It must be exhausting both mentally and physically watching you, maybe because I just turned 66. I was like, how does David <laughs> jump on that table and kneel on the floor? It would take me like a half hour to get up. But, um, you know, it, it, it must be a very challenging role for you every time you perform it. It's becoming more and more challenging, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I... Um, one of my favorite uh, performers of all time is Buster Keaton. So I figure if there's any way I can honor him, I can <laughs> fall on the floor. Because you also played 30 other characters in the course of this play at, and film. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I don't know, I, I don't have a, a resident psychiatrist yet for uh, <laughs> multiple personalities. But um, he was a very performative teacher. That's what we found out. And the students really wanted to, to have his class because of that, that he, uh, he enacted his lessons, uh, so to speak. He would take the contrary position to an issue that we're talking and actually be the communist when he's teaching communism. Um, so we had that in our favor that, uh, yeah, why not just perform as, as, as he did? Um, that, that, that's one of the... the uh, kind of the strap hangers, the handles that I have to carry, carry me through, yeah. Tov, I'll get to your unique perspective in a moment, but Derek, as I was saying, can you just talk about some of the challenges making this film? And can you also just describe the, the source material you used and how it was really a compilation or amalgamation of all kinds of works that were either written about Karski or came from Karski's own words. Yeah, um, you know, the David referenced Clark Young, but we were, that was really, the three of us were really in the trenches for years. Clark had been a former student, but by the time this project started was a professional collaborator. And we, you know, as David said, there was this kind of incredible body of work that was uh, a great biography by E. Thomas Wood, the memoir story of a secret state, all of these films and oral histories. So we had a lot to work with. Um, but it was also, you know, it's very diffuse and it's quite a lot. And a lot of our process was really about distillation and about coming to believe more and more that we could, I think the further we went, the more we felt we could trust Karski, it's a strange thing to say, but like it, a lot of, you know, pretty much every word in the script comes from him, and that there was, you know, we're educators, we're at Georgetown, Karski spent 40 years of his life teaching, and that teaching was not just an imparting of information, it was about the things that Gideon was referencing at the beginning, it was about, um, 
you know, a, a sort of lighting a spark, an urgent kind of spark. And so we felt that we, we were finding all the ways that Karski had done that in his own words. And a lot of our job, and then what was such a great fit about Jeff and the film, was actually in a weird way simplifying, like getting out of the way of the direct exchange. Um, uh, and uh, Did you make many changes from the, the play to the film? Um, there, what was interesting, which was the, the play had just had a couple of professional, it was a very, very, very new play when we shot the film. So it's interesting. We've actually made in some ways a fair number of changes since the shooting of the film, not radical ones. But to because, the play. To the play, because we hadn't done full runs of the play. We had just premiered it briefly in Washington and in London. Um, but people who've seen the play and the film will rec there's a couple scenes that are different, there's some phrases and changes. Um, it, it wasn't so much huge changes, it was just um, being led in a way by, by Jeff on the, and, and his team in the film studio and with Clark as we were working on the script, um, I, I felt like we were really all in sync because both processes were about simplifying to the core elemental things we needed for a direct exchange between David and us as, as Karski students, as witnesses. I thought you did incredible things with lighting and sets when he'd walk into the theater with the Thank program you. or you know, just even walk out of frame and the, the lighting would change to indicate a different moment in time. I thought yeah. that was so effective. Well, thank you. Anyone who works in theater or film knows that you, you, even when you're seeing something, you're like, oh, it's only one person up there, that then those credits roll and it's really an incredible group of artists who make that, that happen and we were so blessed with that, with that group on this. As I watched this, Tova, I, I, I thought about you uh, and how, what your experience would be like watching this film. Well, you know, I've seen many, many movies, read many books. Um, I just wrote one myself, and the Holocaust has been part of my life and my family's life, but I have never, I must tell you, in all the years that I've been watching, and reading, and I have never been so profoundly touched. This is my second time around watching this film. The first time I did it in a privacy of my home, to just, because I got it at home to see, I just couldn't believe it. The words that came out of, of the character were my words, were our words, because I represent the Holocaust, the survivors, I am this, I, I represent the survivors, and I know that there must be some in the audience. I don't even see anybody in the audience, but um, I, I know there must be. It was so profound that I said, did he, does, did he ever talk to me, this, this, this person? And I haven't met anybody here. I'm completely not into theater or, any, or anything. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've learned so much today how you make a movie I, I like that. I, don't, I can't even imagine it, you know. But I said, has he read, does he know me? Does he know us? It, it, it spoke to everything and almost every fiber of, of, of my being. The questions that I've been asking, I was a child survivor. You were and, six years old. At and I was six and a half in Auschwitz when the war ended, so I was there at five and a half. And here is this, this character saying the things that my father, that my mother said to me when we walked out from Auschwitz. She said, remember. She said, remember. And here is this man, you know, saying, remember. Mm -hmm. It was so profound. I can't, I can't tell you. I, 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 I just, when I met you today, only in a, a few hours ago, I, I felt like, oh my God, this is, this is the person who gets it. Not many people get it, you know? By the way, and, um, I, I wanted to and, mention... And, and, and you, you got us the questions. Look, at the, I spoke to somebody from Germany today. I was interviewed by a, a, a German um, 
newspaper guy. Two days ago, I spoke to somebody in Poland and so forth. And the question is, what's going on there? And they said, the anti-Semitism is terrible. It's just, it's just in England, in, in the United States. And I said, what can we do? The same questions you ask. You asked it so well. So, you sure you're not a Jew or something? <laughs> <laughs> He's not. He's not. And, you know, actually, you raised a good point. I wanted to mention the name of Tova's book because it's, it's an incredible story. Your, your life should be a, a, a movie, Tova. It's called The Daughter of Auschwitz, My Story of Resilience, Survival, and Hope. And it's the harrowing story of what Tova experienced as just a little girl. Um, but, but Tova mentions the, the prologue and the epilogue. And David, you and I were talking about this in the lobby before we came in. And, 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 and talk about, well, Derek, and please chime in, the purpose of the prologue and the epilogue and why you decided to, to button the film with those, what you said before and after. Well, the, the choice to do that was uh, to, we, we were trying to find a way to ground it in the now, uh, as if there were a, a common man, any of us, um, plagued by what is going on in the world, trying to figure out how to interrogate it, how to deal with it, uh, how is there something that he, he could do or she could do or we could do. So we thought, let's have a common man present these questions, because they are at the core of, of uh, the piece, really, um, and have him be motivated to uh, ask, almost as if he learned about Jan Karski and he realizes people have to know about this man. I need to tell this story. And that's how we thought to begin it and then to end it with the man in the same place of inquiry and, and, and anxiety and uh, as saying, what can we do? What can we do? What can we take from this man and apply it to the now? That's why we feel this is very much a current events piece, not necessarily a historical document, yes. But it, um, and, 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 and also as perhaps uh, in the Socratic fashion, as a teacher might do with his students, to ask questions when questions are asked and motivate people to try to find their own answers. Um, that's why we made the, the prologue and the epilogue as, as they are. And obviously, Derek, it is incredibly relevant, as Tova said, and I looked up the statistics before I came, according to a report by the ADL earlier this year, anti-Semitic incidents reached an all-time high in the United States in 2021 with a total of 2,717 incidents of assault, okay. harassment, and vandalism. Um, we've seen sickening displays of anti-Semitism this year by some very high-profile individuals there. Uh, disgusting comments applauded. Um, given today's climate, uh, obviously the, the, the prologue and epilogue urges people to not, to, to bear witness, but also to act. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for us, we are of course, you know, urgently alarmed by, you know, not only those statistics, but the sort of sense of what we're experiencing in our world. But I also think in the spirit of Karski, we, from the beginning, a lot of that urgency, it's absolutely about rising anti-Semitism, but there's so many, you know, this is the story of someone who wasn't a Jew, who witnessed what was being done to Jews and uh, became the fiercest kind of, of human ally to that. And so one of the things that's been so moving about starting to share this work with hundreds of young people, having a curriculum, a course we have called Bearing Witness, the legacy of Jan Karski today. We as a team learn an enormous amount from a diverse group of young people encountering this story about what resonates with them. In some cases, it's absolutely rising anti-Semitism, but there are so many applications to it. You know, The conditions and environment around immigration 
isolation and around otherness and who we let in, you know, denial and complacency of all kinds. And certainly as we're, as we're moving <laughs> to going to Poland next week and, you know, exp yeah. encountering there. So, so I think the, for us, those questions are also in Karski style meant, you know, as Socratic in the sense we really, we don't have those answers, but we know that we all need to be grappling with the, these hard, hard questions and having these hard conversations. I have to mention that Tova is really educating young people about this because it's so important for, for the current generation, uh, you know, shockingly is not necessarily well educated about many things, including the Holocaust, and, and Tova has a TikTok channel. Um, she first thought it was Tic Tac, like the breath mints, because her daughter worked for the company. I, my grandson, I never knew what Tic Tac was. I thought it was a candy company. Um, <laughs> But but um, there was a candy company sounds something like right, that. Breath mints. Yes, yes. Yeah. My daughter works there, so you know. I says, "What do they want to know about the Holocaust?" I mean, it didn't make. And then she told me about the the platform of of, of TikTok, and and he said, "You know, just tell me a little bit for for only uh, I think two minutes, because the people who watch it only have two minute attention span." Uh, yes. <laughs> This is very true, Tova. So I said, two minutes, of course. So I did two minutes, and within a few weeks, by the way, um, uh, his name is Aaron, and within two weeks, there were like million of people. Yeah, you have 500,000 followers it now. Was fi it went up to 50 million people. What do you mean? <laughs> I, I don't know why, and and, and but pe some people, some of your things that you were were talking about got fifty million views, f f which yeah, is well, un you know that about followers and visitors. Yeah, I yeah, don't know how yeah, that works. yeah. I hear you. <laughs> uh, this is to me. I I didn't ever saw. I never saw. Even with that, I didn't see myself on TikTok. But but uh, what's wonderful about this whole thing, in a way, is that non-Jews who are very young, 17, 14, 15, are asking questions. Sometimes I get as many as 200 a day. And my grandson- Do you grandson, have time to answer them? Or does your grandson do that? No, we don't. Sometimes he, he knows a lot. So sometimes he answers, Aaron answers, and sometimes I answer. But the idea that they're asking, that's the idea that they're you're doing, asking. You're doing a say, wonderful public service, yeah, Tova. They're asking what? It really happened? That number on your arm? Is that what happened? Tell us about it. And I, we were just amazed. We were amazed. And this is what it is. I am the last generation, because I'm one of the youngest survivors that remembers well, you know, remembers everything, or a lot. And um, what's going to happen after us? So we need movies. We meet, we meet people like you, who will tell the people, when well, I'm not here anymore, you will be here. Your movie will be here. I'm not. So I give you the job. <laughs> and your story you be will. You're the one who's going to tell our story. Mm. In, in, mm. But I was, it was fabulous. I just wanted, I, was, I loved uh. it. I loved it, loved it, really. Uh, yes, that's right. You know, as, uh, as Karski, as Landsman called Karski a hero, and he said, no, no, uh, I'm insignificant little man. Um, I think what we have here is a heroine of, um, of truth and memory, much like Jan Karski was. We, ha we only have a few minutes left, but I do want to just touch on another topic because I watched Ken Burns' six-hour documentary series. Uh, Lynn Novick also worked on it uh, as well. And and Sarah Botstein, I believe. Yeah, I don't want to leave Sarah out because I know she worked very hard on it as well. Um, and I know that it talks about Jan Karski meeting with Felix Frankfurter, a Supreme Court justice, the only Jewish Supreme Court justice at the time, and FDR. Um, but it, it touched on it very briefly. What more can you tell us about those encounters and how frustrated was he you know, he kind of came to terms with it 
at the end, you know, had a certain weariness and, you know, his work was done and things were coming to an end. But it must have been maddening for him. Can you tell us briefly about those encounters and how they impacted him? Yeah, and, and chime in, David. I mean, the interesting thing is we... Uh, he, of course, he told, I mean, those were clearly such core elemental parts of his whole life that he lived with that time. But really what we have about those encounters is what's in the play and what's in the film. And this is very much, you know, something about Karski is he didn't, um, you know, he was a, a messenger, a camera. He was 28 years old when he met with, Rose, with Roosevelt. Of course, he, you know, he then you know, wrote Story of a Secret State and then went on and, and didn't speak for 35 years. But our, he was not someone, and, and David can speak to this too because he really has built the role through understanding this, I think, but he wasn't someone who pointed, you know, he was, he described what happened. And I think he understood, one of the things I really admired about the film, Ken Lynn and Sarah's film, is that it, I think it captures the complexity of the bind and, and Karski too, and I think he chose very specifically, I think, to bear witness in this way by telling us what happened. This was, he remembered the encounter and the dialogue. And there's not, you can look far and wide for lots of like what he was feeling internally about it or whatever, but that's actually not what's in the memoir. And so I think we're left with our questions, which is part of what, you know, about, um, you know, the, you know what, what might Roosevelt have done differently? Do we go back to that history? What's the complexity of the bind he was in? What, with Frankfurter, what different ways of knowing are there? There's having information, and then there's, under, you know, understanding and actually being comprehension, able to process comprehension. Right? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's quite significant that he was... 28 years old, he had, had managed to navigate horrors and death and get to uh, meet the, the leader of the free world. And all along, he was considered it his duty. He had committed himself to this. And when he says a satisfied weariness, okay, I made it. I actually delivered the package. And I think much as it, in, in our own lives, we have had events in our past that we weren't immediately aware of. And it takes sometimes years um, to learn about what that moment was and to actually deal with it in ourselves. And I think that's what Karski was doing. Why he chose to be silent for 35 years is a mystery. We can make a lot of conjectures about it, and we have. But it takes sometimes a, 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 a lifetime to understand what happened. What, what are your conjectures about his, you know, why he couldn't talk about it? Was it trauma? Was it fear of anti-Semitism? What do you think it was? It had to have been traumatic. He did say many times that he considered himself a failure. And, uh, and maybe because his wife, had uh, Pola, had experienced her whole life, or her, her, or her whole family perishing. We don't want to talk about this. We don't want to bring this into our house. And as all reports are, is that he was a very, uh, he was a very uh, uh, well-mannered and dignified uh, gentleman, but he had a great sense of humor, and he had so much concern and for his students. That was, I feel, he, trans, he, he, he took his experience and said, I do not want to burden them with the horror, but I want to engage them with the thinking of it somehow. I'm not putting it very well, but that's one reason why he was silent. But that, I think that you know, speech at the end, uh, you know, uh, it reminded me of this. I, when you watch the U.S. and the Holocaust, the Ken Burns docu series, 
this Frida Kirchway in the nation. I thought, if the, I'm gonna read this quote because it was so powerful to me and it reminded me very much of the speech at the end about people not knowing, not wanting to know, that ignorance, complacency. But she wrote in the nation, and this was during the war, in this country, you and I and the President and the Congress and the State Department are accessories to the crime and share Hitler's guilt. If we had behaved like humane and generous people instead of complacent, cowardly ones, the Jews lying today in the earth of Poland and Hitler's other crowded graveyards would be alive and safe, and other millions yet to die would have found sanctuary. We had it in our power to rescue these doomed people, and we did not lift a hand to do it. Or perhaps it would be fair to say that we lifted just one cautious hand encased in a tight-fitting glove of quotas and visas and affidavits and a thick layer of prejudice. Mm. I thought that was such a prof profound quote. And it really did echo what Karski says at the end of the film and play. Were those his words? And I'm curious, when did he say them? Um, well, the, the, the ones about um, uh, uh, the second original sin. And yes. That was at, uh, a speech he gave, sin, that was a speech he gave at um, uh, the International um, Liberators, Conference, Liberators in Conference in 1981 that, that Elie Wiesel had invited him uh, to come um, and, and speak. That was 1981. And I think it relates to your previous question because I think we have to, I mean, Tova would be so much more expert on, on this, but I think part of the silence was that, and part of what motivated that Liberators Conference was that many, many people were silent. There was a, you know, that... that Tova, why don't you address that? Yeah. That's sort of very true. Use your mic. Oh, yeah, forgot. When we first came to America in 1950, I remember going to school, and my teacher said, "Cover up that arm. Don't let it. This is this. You're an American now. Change your name to something American. Cut your hair." And you know, I did that. I did that because nobody wanted to hear anything. It was like it was almost like 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 we did something. I felt, in fact, a doctor. Um, I was 12 and a half or 13. He said, what do you need this number for? I'll, take, I'll give you a gift. I will take it off. And you, you'll never know if anything happened. But you know, I wouldn't do that. I said, no, I didn't do anything wrong, but it did make us feel that we did something terrible. And, and that we went, we went uh, to our deaths like, like sheep or something. We went to the slaughter. Like, like, like cows, like animals, like, like we, why, why did you fight? Why, there's people couldn't even understand people like us to fight how and with what and so forth. So you're right, there was a silence for a very long time. I started talking after I have children and my children in, in, in high school said to me, Oh, I, sp I spoke at home, with, they knew it, but not on the outside world. In fact, after I wrote the book, a friend of mine called me, I knew him for 60 years, and he said to me, how come you never told us? We know each other 60 years. I said, at that time, nobody listened. You're right. There was like, like, this, like it, it, as if you were covering up the shame under the rug. You know, it was just too much for people to bear. You know, my mom was Jewish, and I didn't find out until I was 10 years old and saw menorah in my uncle's bookcase. And I, I was raised Presbyterian, but I think there was still a lot of fear of anti-Semitism. You know, I grew up in Virginia where there weren't that many Jewish families. And I wish I had learned that much earlier and that I had a greater appreciation of my heritage, and I'm really proud of it. And people always say, you're so smart, I knew you were Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in, in closing, David, you know, you have done, I mean, you've had such an extraordinary career and continue to, I think, get better and better, like a fine wine. <laughs> um, 
But I, but I imagine the character of, of Jan, Jan Karski must be incredibly close to your heart and has almost permeated your psyche in a way other characters haven't. Um, what do you think ultimately you, you've learned from the experience of portraying a man like this? Well, that's a, what have I learned, or what am I continually learning, is that the, um, one thing is that the power of uh, the creative arts, uh, whatever form it's in, is um, something that we should continue to support because it is a, a portal through which we can examine uh, our lives, our histories, um, reckon with things that are confusing to us, find words in order to express what we're feeling. I think the, the theater and film uh, have become uh, th that for us as a, as a civilization, as a, as a species, we have created this, uh, this tool uh, to hopefully um, hold a mirror up to our own natures and help us uh, uh, try to find, in the words of the, our, that great man, our better angels. Um, so that's what, what I've, I've learned that by doing this, this is something that um, um, is really very, very fulfilling. Um, and uh, I've also learned that there often are no answers, but as long as you are, have the courage to, and the, the will and, and, and the inclination to ask the questions enough times, that you might find a little glimmer of an answer to, to carry you through. Um, I think that's what Karski was doing with his students, teaching them ways to encounter the world from the view of the past so that the present would not be so astoundingly confusing. Um, and I'd, I've also learned that um, that as he called himself an insignificant little man, I've learned that there are as similar, as many similar insignificant little people everywhere who are capable of doing what he did. The right thing, yeah. Well, I, um, before you all go and before we go, I want to let everyone know the film is having a limited theatrical release beginning on Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is January 27th at the Quad Cinema in New York City. Then L L Lomley? Lemley, I think. Lemley, sorry. Lemley in Los Angeles, if anyone is out on the West Coast, and select cities nationwide. And you can also go to Remember This, Karski Film, Com. It then premieres on PBS, great performances on March 13th, with an encore presentation on April 16th. So David, Derek, and Tova, thank you all so much, and congratulations on a wonderful piece of art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie.